All right, so you know, I'm a reconstructive urologist. I did not train uh, in robotics uh, as for a fellowship uh, things, but you know, one thing that highlights um, reconstructive urology is that the exposure could be really difficult. It's really hard to see, and you know, it's the goal is to change to an easy surgery. I think there's a reason that no one's giving master classes on circumcision because that's one where you have easy identified uh, anatomy and good exposure. So, you know, robotics. I don't have to convince this audience about the reach and visualization, but it's it's excellent. And for rare cases like the ones that I do, like the one that actually tell does with fistulas, it's great to record it so you can show others how to do it. I think that's a key part. So um, what I do in New York, I have kind of a standard reconstructive practice, but I do um, about 175 robotic cases a year. Uh, and I don't do any kind of cancer operations, so all these are reconstructive surgery. So how do you get to 175 reconstructive surgery? Well, I highlighted kind of in yellow kind of cases that I would say most uh, you know, robotics and reconstructive urologists really don't do, which is kind of really deep posterior re reconstruction and transgender surgery. The common theme is that it occurs deep in the pelvis, you know, space that's hard to get to, even a space that's hard for traditional robotics, multi-port systems to get to. And so I think that SP is a godsend. Um, and for many things that we do in reconstructive urology, there's just not great repairs. And the reason is that there's difficult things, even though the cess is high. And if you want something to occur more commonly, you have to make it easier. Um, so so uh, Dr. Kou gave a talk already about what is the SP. I want to highlight that uh, if you just look at this picture, um, you see that it, it's a very narrow system, and then it flares out. And just imagine if the pubic bone's right above that area where it flares out, you could have much better access. Um, and so besides the cosmesis and things, I mean, I think it's really great with the additional double wristing kind of elbow uh, joint articulation and less clashing deep spaces. Uh, this is how we get access at NYU. I, we work with plastic surgery all the time. Uh, I was doing this and was, they said, oh, why don't you just make an umbilical plasty incision? Uh, it's a nice one where you can make a circular incision, drop the belly button down, move that circle, uh, three or four centimeters on either side, uh, and then when you close it, it heals very nicely. Um, things. So um, I, I'll skip through the docking and, and the instruments because Dr. Kuhu showed this. Um, you do need a little bit additional spaces because you're kind of swinging the boom all over the uh, vice. So, uh, and you do need to have the bed a little bit positioned differently so you don't have the head in the uh, floor. So, um, so you know, cool things with cystectomy. I, I don't, I don't think it's it's that particular things. This is a female cystectomy incisions. Um, I mean, these are kind of standard operations. Well, what would you do for this? You know, this is the patient. I, I would challenge my colleagues uh, in GRS to do. This is the patient with a um, prostatic uh, false passage. He's the CIC, uh, just proximal to the sphincter with an open bladder neck. So if you do a transperineal approach, you would render this person incontinent. By the way, he also has an augmentation cystoplasty, um, and it would be very difficult to put in lithotomy because he has no legs. Uh, the SP made this actually a quite easy case. We get access um, in the uh, uh, left upper quadrant, go down, do the resection there. Similarly, this is another case with a patient had uh, a cystectomy, an open cystectomy, developed an enterocutaneous fistula, had um, the bowel stuck essentially anteriorly to the abdominal wall. Uh, it's paper thin. You can kind of see the video shot from the outside, the movement. Well, I think it, would have been quite, it was quite challenging to get it to get a port in, but once you got it in, we were able to do all the lice of the adhesion from the inside without having to make the incision on the skin. I would challenge to do that with multi-port robotics. So, things. Um, it also allows for very easy concurrent external and internal surgery. The picture uh, on um, the left side is, is a, a panectomy occurring at the end reconstruction, occurring at the same time as the inguinal lymph node dissection. Um, you're allowed able to do this things. Um, the picture on the other side is a anterior urethroplasty uh, that is being performed at the same time as a robotic posterior urethroplasty. This is a patient who had both a stenosis proximal to the external sphincter uh, and distal, and we're able to do the entire reconstruct the entire uh, urethra. Um, on both sides simultaneously.
Um, it does allow for more room. Uh, you can just see just a comparison with the XI. You can kind of see the uh, external surgeon's head kind of being uh, ducking between the arms, whereas you have much more room with the SP. Um, and allows really for, uh, I think, multi-quadrant. So this is an operation where uh, we did a omento free flap harvest. Uh, patients with lymphedema, um, it's well known within the plastic surgery literature that uh, if you put new lymph nodes transfer there that you could reduce chronic lymphedema. Uh, it is a problem with the genitals. And so this is a omentum free flap. Um, it did a kind of like a RPLD position. And, and we're able to do external work with reducing the lymphedema while the robot's docked. So just to highlight again the advantages of the single port procedure uh, compared to multi-port for deep pelvic surgery, you can see kind of a single arm, then the uh, instruments flares out. So let's see, let's see how to play this. And then here is a side-to-side -side comparison of a post-prostatectomy uh, vesco-urethral anastomic stenosis, otherwise known as a bladder neck contracture. So these are patients who had a prostatectomy, they're stenosis and require uh, reconstruction. You can see how the XI it was clashing against the bone, grinding against it, whereas the SP, because of the double-jointed articulation, you're able to throw sutures deep in the pelvis um, I think and provide a nice reconstruction. Just need to advance to the next slide. It's uh, the well, mouse isn't working. Oh, here it is. Okay, here it is. Uh, there are other operations that um, you know we've devised using the procedure that isn't commonly done. One thing that I do is transgender surgery. Uh, it's typically done as a penile inversion where the penis is inverted in. But in this age of um, hormonal blockade, many patients do not have adequate penile skin. A uh, scrotal skin graft is another tissue that could be used, but also they may be inadequate. And so a procedure that's been a, in existence um, really for uh, over 80 years is a, a peritoneal flat vaginoplasty. Uh, it's also otherwise known as the Davidoff procedure. So that really has gone out of favor because the need to do intra-abdominal access uh, as well as difficulty with suturing peritoneal flaps deep in the pelvis. Uh, we've revived this operation at NYU. Um, it, it's, uh, there's, there's actually other um, videos being presented at this very AUA by other centers who've replicated our technique. Um, so essentially, the idea is that we raise a peritoneal flap off of the posterior aspect of the bladder, as well as the anterior aspect of the sigmoid. Essentially, we take the pouch of Douglas and use the anterior and posterior surface to make the apex of the vagina. Then the vagina goes into the space between the rectum and prostate. So we do a uh, anti-grade dissection. This would be very similar to a retzia sparing prostatectomy. Um, this is also a great uh, approach for rectal urethral fistula repairs. Um, and we dissect all the way down um, until where we meet our essential perineal dissection. So, um, and this is just essentially the rectums below us and doing the, the last dissections. Here's that shortened penile flap that isn't of enough length to make the vagina. We push that flap in with our dilator. Then we do a circumferential anastomosis between the posterior uh, peritoneal flap and the posterior access of the skin, uh, skin flap. Um, and you can see here, we're able to create a nice vaginal canal uh, in a patient with a short phallus without using any additional uh, other tissue. Um, we've done this um, for revision surgeries. There's many patients who develop vaginal stenosis after vaginal plasty. Um, we, we have uh, this. Uh, was presented at this very meeting on the revision surgery, and um, this technique was published in the Journal of Urology uh, this year. I think. So here you can see that the anterior and posterior flaps are sutured together along the sides. So, and then now we bring the anterior uh, peritoneal flap to the posterior flap. So basically the posterior aspect of the bladder gets sutured to the anterior aspect of the sigmoid, and that becomes the new apex of the neovagina. Um, this allows one to achieve a nice vaginal depth of 15 to 18 centimeters. Uh, it also um, obviates the need to use intestine uh, for uh, vaginal plasty. Um, so here it is. You can see from the outside a very deep canal. Uh, we, we put packing in to, um, to both for hemostasis but also to really maintain the space of the canal. Um, uh, the, 
pelvic floor will close if you don't uh, dilate, and so all uh, patients undergo a regimen of dilation all the way up to this cavity. And so here's what it looks externally, um, and in, uh, this is what the uh, umbilical plasty incision looks like. And for revision surgeries, this is a pre-op where there's an inadequate depth of the canal. Uh, and then after we did a surgery like this, you can see that that goes all the way in to six or seven inches. So uh, my experience so far, the last time I checked, uh, you know, I think the column was on the one side shows kind of standard cases, pyoplastic, cystectomy, uh, salvage prostatectomy, et cetera. On the other side shows kind of the unusual cases that the SP has really enabled to do that I would say would otherwise be very difficult or not possible at all with multi-port robotics. Uh, posterior erythroplasty, uh, certain fissure repairs, rectus flap harvest. I actually do the rectus flap harvest within the rectus sheath without making an incision between other things. So, so to conclude, uh, the SP is, uh, allows excellent access to the deep pelvis. The double jointed action allows for increased uh, dexterity, allows for concurrent external surgery, and there's gonna be many, many new, new operations that we're gonna invent using the SP. Thank you.